Thanks for joining us today, everyone, for this Safety and Health Magazine webcast sponsored by BIS Safety Software. We are going to let our audience settle in for just a moment, and we'll be back with you shortly. Thanks again to everyone joining us today. We will let our audience just settle in for just a moment before we get today's presentation started. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast, Maximize Efficiency, Minimize Costs, The Power of Digital Orientation Programs, sponsored by BIS Safety Software. My name is Barry Botino. I'm an associate editor at Safety and Health and a co-host of the On the Safe Side podcast. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to share with you all. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speakers and organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. At the conclusion of today's event, we'll conduct a Q&A with our speakers. If you have a question, just click that Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and press the send button. You can submit those questions at any time during today's event. After this presentation, you'll also be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, but I'll tell you more about that a little later. This webcast will be archived. If you want to view this presentation or any of our past webcasts, please go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. Now let's introduce our speakers. Joining us today are Scott McLeod and Andrew Lintz. Scott has nearly a decade of experience in the safety software industry, and he's worked with large companies in construction, transportation, mining, and oil and gas in North America and Australia. His work has helped those companies improve their training and safety programs across the organization. Andrew has an extensive background in academia, and his passion is the creation of engaging, unique, and memorable e-learning courses for the safety industry. He has helped develop training courses on a variety of topics, including lockout tagout, pipeline construction safety, and defensive driving. We thank you all for tuning in today, and to guide us through the event, I'd like to welcome in Michael Blanchard, who is BIS Safety Software's Communications Manager. Whenever you're ready, Michael, please take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Barry. Thanks so much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Blanchard, and I work in the communications team at BIS Safety Software. First off, I just wanted to thank you all for joining the webinar. Um, and in this presentation, we're gonna cover the transition to digital onboarding and orientations, review how it can be beneficial for both time savings as well as um, monetary savings. Um, but we're also gonna cover some of the pitfalls, the common pitfalls of transitioning online and how you can kind of overcome those as you're making that transition. Before we dive in, I just wanted to go over the objectives of the webinar. So Scott McLeod is going to cover uh, the key benefits of transitioning to online onboarding and orientations. He's going to take us through a few case studies, uh, real world success stories. We're going to provide some tips on how to best choose the right digital onboarding tools for your company. Uh, we're going to cover some best practices for creating engaging training material. We're also going to cover those challenges I mentioned earlier, some common challenges on making the transition online. And then finally, we're going to cover how to evaluate your return on investment for making the switch to online onboarding and orientations. So with that, I am going to pass it over to Scott McLeod, who's going to take us through the first section of this presentation. Scott, take it away. Thanks, Michael. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. Uh, for the first section of today's discussion, I'd like to cover sort of the catalyzing um, reasons for businesses to transition to online onboarding and orientations. Um, and then obviously the benefits that these organizations can or have realized um, as part of these transitions. Um, and discussing obviously some of the pitfalls and challenges that organizations face, um, you know, when making this sort of transition uh, into the online orientation world. Before we get started in terms of the actual, um, you know, challenges and reasons and whatnot, I do want to clarify um, the difference between orientation and onboarding in the world that, you know, that, that we basically live in uh, daily. Orientations are typically going to be described as a one-time initial offering to an employee that takes place within the first day or two of employment, uh, typically you know, to orientate those individuals to a specific job site or a, a specific job role, whereas onboarding uh, more traditionally is a longer process, often stretched over months with multiple trainings, multiple resources um, layered into that employee's role. For the purpose of today's discussion, I will apologize because oftentimes those two terms do get interchanged uh, in the discussion. So if I say orientation, I could very well mean onboarding and vice versa. Uh, just keep that in mind as, uh, as we progress that for the most part, the concepts that we're presenting today are focused on both. Um, the question I want you all to consider as we're discussing this is, has your organization already seen a shift to online orientations and onboarding? And then what were the catalysts for the shifts internally? Hopefully this presentation will highlight those reasons um, that you're already familiar with and then highlight other new ideas to consider. So let's get started um, in terms of the uh, in-person and traditional onboarding orientations and the common challenges that typically are faced by businesses and the reasons why they migrate into these, uh, these new online formats. So first, foremost, booking in-person trainers. Coordinating training schedules and availability against other day-to-day -day job requirements is enormously uh, challenging when you're dealing with, you know, whether it's, you know, a unique onboarding experience for a group of employees or whether it's a long onboarding experience carried out over time. Is this a part-time requirement for your business? Is it a full-time commitment for this particular role? And if so, are you hiring new personnel into that position or reallocating your existing personnel resources? That could potentially leave gaps in your current operational requirements. Um, and realistically booking those personal, those actual in-person trainers presents that scheduling challenge against what their other day-to-day -day requirements are. Secondarily, booking training spaces. For larger companies, they may have you know, an enormous access to facilities. They can allocate boardrooms. They can allocate meeting spaces. But for many companies, dedicated spaces are at a premium. And the costs associated to renting facilities to accommodate onboarding uh, can certainly add up. And then we have to take into account those other components of you know, presenter equipment and power slash internet to those facilities. Those are all additional cost burdens that come into play when we're talking about you know, uh, traditional onboarding. Print materials and physical resources. Uh, you know, there are costs to developing uh, physical uh, training materials and the time needed to put those resources together. That all presents a burden for businesses. If you're putting together binders, if you're having the individual, you know, that assistant or the administrator or the trainer themselves having to take the time to put together those resources into packages, that all adds up. And then as well, workforces today are more inclined to prefer digital versions of reference materials that they can access on demand when they need it and if they need it. That presents less production costs, it's easily scalable, and it's much better for the environment overall if we're not you know, generating binders full of paper. Um, next is training session inconsistencies. Ensuring that all training ses uh, sessions provide the same baseline information is critical when you're looking for consistency in the organization. We wanna make sure that nothing critical is omitted and that the delivery of the message you know, presents that consistency for all employees that are experiencing that onboarding. And that's a challenge when you have different you know, uh, facilitators for these events. You have facilitation taking place over time. Is that same consistent and critical message being delivered all the time? Then we have different learning styles and preferences. A single instructor at the, at standing at the front of a, of a room finds it nearly impossible to deliver the content to a room filled with numerous learning styles different learning abilities, different education levels, potentially different native languages. I mean, th you think about, you know, to our days in school, those instructors basically are presenting material in how they know best, but that's not necessarily the right mechanism or way that those learners or those employees are able to absorb that information. 
Uh, coordination of schedules, finding a time that works well for everyone, especially if you're hiring, hiring for roles that is not being done in large groups. Like it's easy enough if you're bringing 50 people in for an onboarding session to keep them all together for that, you know, initial one or two day process. But delivering, uh, you know, an ongoing hiring requirement where every week there's maybe a handful of individuals starting, the following week onboarding is continuing for the first group, but this new group is experiencing the, the start of the new process and whatnot. All of that coordination is allocating additional resources to your organization. Coordinating those groups together at the right start times could potentially also delay your hiring practices, right? It's more important to get the people in and started than delaying three or four weeks just so that you can accommodate that uh, that scheduled onboarding time. And then finally, you know, components like transportation to the learning space. Are your organizations incurring large travel expenses to bring people together for that training? Are we talking flights or ground transportation? If they're driving their own vehicles, are we covering parking for them? Are accommodations required uh, you know, for overnight stays or for long onboarding processes? Meals, hourly rates to have the employees in transit, all of that adds up to an, you know, an exceptionally large cost to accommodate something that online orientations and onboarding can, uh, can eliminate uh, you know, very, very quickly and easily. So moving on then, why go online? So let's talk about some of the uh, you know, a, a initial benefits that organizations can uh, realize from this transition. So online content can be deployed in multiple languages. So imagine the power in having, you know, an English, a Spanish, a French, uh, you know, a Thai version of your orientation that is generated for the individual based upon their account preferences within the learning management system that you're employing. You know, basically I can select that, you know, if English is my native uh, tongue, I'm going to get that version of the orientation assigned to me. If my preference is Spanish, then I will have the, the Spanish presentation. That improves my ability to learn and understand the material that you're delivering including voiceover to improve engagement and understanding the material, as well as having captions available to accommodate individuals with disabilities or those that learn by seeing, right? It's great to have voiceover and it's highly recommended that your content is voiced over for, you know, for those individuals to be, remain engaged, but being able to read that information certainly helps with the uh, information absorption for a lot of people as, you know, when they are learning new material. We eliminate the challenge of scheduling and provide remote team members with a truly remote option. Um, if you think about, you know, the transition we've seen over the last few years, there's a significantly larger proportion of the uh, of the populace that are working remote um, to bring them in for an onboarding uh, or an orientation or even to drive through a virtual instructor led session. We still encounter the scheduling challenges. We still encounter the resource challenges of having those instructors. A truly remote option gives those uh, those learners the ability to take the training when they are able to take the training at the right time and be able to absorb that information. Employees can learn at their own pace. I guess that's where I was going with that last bullet point. We can ensure that the information is taken in, that they are tested properly throughout the, uh, throughout the training material, and the testing is integrated into the content so that we can confirm those knowledge checks throughout. We can also set logic up in these types of online orientations where competency assessments are applied after the fact. So not only are we able to deliver the material at the time of the orientation, but we can have time triggered responses where those where that knowledge is checked throughout the employee's progress as um, with your organizations. And then finally, advanced features like virtual proctoring can provide participation verification and confirm the identity of the employee completing the courses. Um, I've you know, seen many, many, many times employees attempting to bypass an online onboarding solution or an online orientation by having their spouse, partner, you know, best friend, child sit down in front of the computer and click the next button as they progress through. And at the end, it still shows a completion, but that individual absorbed none of the information. Solutions like virtual proctoring can validate that that employee is in fact who they say they are, can confirm that they are in front of that computer for the entire session, and it can be accomplished with significantly lower costs than having an actual proctor or an instructor in place. Additional benefits, you know, today's workforce is much more inclined to prefer digital methods of content delivery. They tend to be more conscious of their environmental footprint, uh, where print materials and resources are involved. Uh, you know, the ability to avoid having to travel or bring large groups together. Um, all of that impacts the environment and these workforces these days are, are significantly more aware of what that impact is. We've all seen that shift to the to remote work during the pandemic. Online orientations work significantly better for that style of employment, making it easy to accommodate distance employees. And as employers, it also widens the prospective markets where we can acquire great talent. 
There's nothing worse than turning down great talent because they happen to reside outside of your effective sphere of operations. This can bring that great talent into your organizations. And then most learning management systems allow you to set up role specific curriculums for unique distribution of content to employees. So you're no longer delivering just a general onboarding experience or a general orientation. You can cater and customize the automated assignment of requirements based upon the specific location or job title that an employee holds. Moving on from there, all the associated costs for online uh, in per, or for in-person training can be eliminated. There's no travel expenses. There's no facility costs. Reduced instructor overhead or allocating those resources into an instructor position. All of the material costs for print um, uh, resources and whatnot are gone. And then um, the unknown factor is oftentimes it's significantly quicker to do an online orientation or an onboarding solution than it is in person because you're eliminating all those other off track variables, all the side discussions and whatnot, we can get this accomplished with a significantly a lower investment in time. Once an effective orientation and onboarding uh, program is, de is deployed, it can be distrib distributed to one or thousands of new hires with the exact same efficiencies. So realistically, the upfront cost of development of a program pays for itself significantly over time. And as the content and the orientation is completed, both feedback and reporting mechanisms can give you real-time updates on the onboarding processes without resorting to collection and analysis of vast amounts of data and documentation, which is, again, is an administratively heavy task. As well, role-specific training can ensure that the right people are presented the right information for their role. No need to accommodate multiple roles in one room or spread training requirements over multiple days to accommodate different groups. Again, by speeding up that onboarding processes, uh, process, new hires can begin to be productive for your organizations much quicker and reduce that initial onboarding expense. Surveys that have been conducted with today's workforces indicate that new hires have a much higher level of employee satisfaction um, and retention when a consistent and effective onboarding solution is used. And the actual absorption of information is approximately 70% better when delivered in an online self-paced learning environment versus classroom environments. So the ability to recall that information is significantly better. So that frames up a whole bunch of positive reasons in the textbook world as to why online training is better than the traditional methods. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, overcomes many of the challenges that we presented in the first slide. But then let's look at real world case studies where organizations have employed these changes and seen immediate benefits. So for a first case study, we're going to be discussing Suncor Energy. Um, this is an organization that I actually had the benefit of working directly with a number of years ago. Um, and ideally, what they were dealing with was a, a large build project in the uh, northern Alberta oil sands sites where they had multiple contractors. And when I say multiple, I'm talking, you know, six or seven prime contractors employing tens of thousands of individual uh, contractors that were on site. Um, they required or they started this process with the traditional instructor led method of delivering their site orientations needed full-time on-site trainers. They needed dedicated trailers because we're not talking about a big city environment. We're talking about a Northern Alberta in the trees, in the bush location where this facility was being created. So they were bringing in trailers for classrooms. They had daily bus runs to transport people from airports and from their, their camps that were being set up to accommodate them into the sites for the training. And then all the administrative support to coordinate the scheduling, coordinate who was arriving on those buses and whatnot to ensure that it was done as effectively as possible. But the reality is that these contractors were coming in from you know, global locations and realistically arriving at site and having to begin this onboarding process at the site. They identified the fact that a new approach was needed because it was not efficient enough. It carried an enormous expense and realistically it was slowing the process down. And they identified some key you know, messages and you know, components that they needed to have included within the orientation. And they progressed to an online uh, version of this. Um, this all fostered Suncor's journey to zero safety culture. It reduced their cost and it supported site productivity and improvements. So they turned to our organization. Um, we created the content, provided engaging voiceover, integrated virtual proctoring technology, and what it resulted in was a cost savings of approximately $5 million um, annually realized from productivity improvements. They eliminated the orientation trailers. They eliminated full-time positions of trainers. 
um, all the busing requirements um, that were needed to bring people in for the orientations were gone. And most importantly, most of these contractors were able to accommodate the training requirement as a requirement before they arrived at site. So if you wanted to work on this job site and you were hired as a contractor, you were completing your virtual proctored orientation prior to getting on the airplane to come to the site. When the individuals arrived at site, they were, be able to, they were able to be ushered through the gate access just by validating that their orientation was completed. Their badge IDs were created from the proctoring system that was collecting their, their facial recognition, and they were granted access to the site for their site-specific orientations. So a massive, massive undertaking um, by Suncor to transition uh, uh, basically gave them immediate cost reduction. Quick ROI, um, they you know got their, a positive return on their investment within months of the full of the full rollout, and the virtual proctoring component provided enhanced due diligence. Um, I don't know if anyone on the call has ever been to Northern Alberta. Um, it's not a very hospitable place within the winters. And jokingly, uh, you know, our clients often said that they had professional orientation takers, individuals that would much rather sit through a classroom based based orientation because they could just slide into the trailers whenever they wanted to then deal with the minus 40 minus 50 degree weather this online orientation also improved that productivity and, and reduced those costs because these individuals could only take this orientation as part of their initial induction and weren't able to do it again moving on to case study number two was toyota europe so again Employing a traditional instructor uh, delivery method was not achieving the results that they uh, were, were needing. So they migrated to an online onboarding approach. And what that generated for them was consistency. It allowed them to create a consistent customer first message that was sent to over 20,000 employees on the initial rollout. The assessments were able to test employee knowledge as they progressed through their onboarding to ensure uh, that they absorbed the material properly. The orientations progressed significantly faster than what their traditional methods were. They were able to take a five hour orientation session and convert it down into an efficient one hour online orientation, which to be honest is significantly quicker than my experience. I typically would quote clients at about a three to one ratio. So for every three hours of traditional methods, we can usually reduce that down to a one hour. So that's a fantastic result that they were able to reduce it to basically 20% of their, of their traditional orientation method. And then finally, almost 90% of the employees expressed satisfaction with that experience. And it allowed those uh, with questions to receive additional one-on-one -on -one support when needed, but it eliminated that need for that one-on-one -on -one support for the, uh, for the uh, employees within the organization that were good to go following that. So some great results for Toyota Europe on a, you know, on a transition to or, uh, online. Finally, case study number three is with a civil engineering firm that uh, we worked with in the past. They ultimately decided that they needed an e-orientation um, to, uh, you know, to generate a more improved approach over their traditional methods. Um, the e-orientation that they developed took approximately 52 minutes to complete. That was versus, I believe, about two and a half to three hours over their traditional uh, orientation methods. So this falls better, more closely in line with that three to one ratio that I was describing earlier. Um, the marks and the quiz results were stored online. So they we could access that data or the client could access data, that data on demand anytime they needed to. Completion emails were sent to their superintendents and regional HSC manager at the moment of completion. So they had access to that data real time without the need to co you know, collaborate and collect information from uh, multiple sources. The reporting and statistics, again, on demand, and then a 100% consistency in information. This group offered orientations across the country in different facilities and different sites. So this significantly improved the consistency of the information being delivered, and they could deliver that information 20 24-7. So the actual hard results in a direct monthly comparison with, uh, with the expectation of about 5,000 orientations completed per month over 12 months, the regular orientation costs that were generated were approximately $92,500. The e-orientation cost reduced that down to $36,000. So they realized almost a $56,000 monthly savings or an annual savings of about $670,000 just by that single transition. The majority of that came from time cost per employee. We're talking about an e-orientation that ultimately was just, you know, let's say $75 to deliver. Um, and and that, that was accommodating cost of delivery as well as the time for the employee. And then versus an associated cost of approximately $225 per employee to take their traditional method. 
So again, you know, taking into account the development of resources, obviously there's an upfront cost to development of the orientation, but that sort of savings annually can significantly affect the bottom line of, of a company. So that's, you know, three great case studies of organizations that realize the benefits, um, you know, of a transition to this. Obviously, it's a big move for a company. And part of today's discussion um, that we want to share are some tips for selecting the right onboarding software and making sure that this transition goes smoothly. So, you know, components that we're going to be discussing in this section, selecting the right software, uh, tips for rolling out those tools, and, the, uh, and then other components like privacy and security that need to be taken into consideration as you're moving over to this sort of solution. So first and foremost, selecting the right onboarding solution. Um, the question that organizations need to ask themselves is where is there room for automation in your process um, and where does it benefit you to switch to the online solution and ensuring that whatever solution provider you opt in for meets all of your current process needs, satisfies outstanding gaps that you've identified, and then potentially checks off those wish list items as well. So the nice to haves, not the need to haves. Think through what those items are in your current onboarding process that you absolutely have to have and make sure that the systems replicate that. And then when those nice to haves come into play, make sure you are asking the questions about does the, does the software accommodate it currently? Is that a future state? You know, what does that look like as you flex additional requests and whatnot into, uh, into the capabilities of that software? There's nothing worse than, software, than systems that are meant to speed up processes that are bulky and hard to utilize or that don't meet all the requirements and add new or additional administrative requirements to maintain. As well, as your company grows, ensure the systems that you're putting in place can grow with you without causing additional administrative work. So scalability is hugely important. The reality is, is that maybe it is onboarding and the speed of acquisition of new hires that potentially is slowing down the growth of your organization. If you could remove that barrier and increase your growth by a thousand percent, can the software that you're employing accommodate that level of growth as well? And then finally, measuring efficiencies. Avoid systems that require several separate software elements to complete tasks that you need. Um, ideally, what you're looking for is a solution that offers all features and all solutions under one roof. Um, having integrated notification systems that can keep all parties in the know is imperative. What we don't want to have do, uh, you know, systems doing is having to have manual admins looking into it, compiling reports, compiling notifications, and, and, and broadcasting out to the parties that need to know. We want to eliminate manual intervention and communications and have those, those single systems being able to accommodate all of that. That includes sign-offs, workflow, feedback loops, uh, renewal tracking for requirements uh, that might have to have a recurrence of training, and then obviously just general correspondence from the system all of that should be easily automated um, you know, for updates and communication. And then finally, built-in reporting and analytics to simplify access to all data uh, collected. We want to know about course completions. We want to know about digital paperwork submission, escalations for things that are not completed on time, aggregate testing results. You know, what answers are get, being given right or wrong in those, uh, in those testings that are being done? Is there something that we need to train better on in order to answer those questions more effectively and getting global median results as a result of that. Organizations can utilize the data collected from online um, onboarding solutions to improve what their onboarding looks like. Um, and we've actually seen an expansion of that with the use of virtual proctoring where proctoring solutions can actually measure engagement of the employees. As they're sitting through those sessions, just the facial recognition component can determine areas where the employees are bored, they're falling asleep, so all of that component can be, you know, can be taken into account. Um, gap analysis reporting is absolutely huge. Organizations that do traditional methods of onboarding and training are used to manual Excel tracking. <coughs> they're able, you know, they're having administrative assistants compiling that data and delivering it to the, you know, the bodies that need it. True online systems with, with reporting and analytics should be able to generate that result for you real time and give you access to that gap, uh, gap reporting at a glance. Um, keep in mind, and I, I mentioned this briefly at the start of this section, compliance and security. Obviously, migrating to an online system puts you in a position where your data and your user information is now oftentimes in the cloud, right? These are typically solutions that are not on-premise, um, just to ensure that, you know, that keeping the software up to date is, uh, is something that's easily, 
you know, achievable by the solution providers. So you're typically dealing with a, with a SaaS or a software as a service based application. Uh, keep in mind that's the compliance requirements for your personal data. Um, ask your providers, do they under, undergo annual security audits? So, you know, uh, like a SOC 2 audit or are they ISO 27001 uh, certified? You know, do we meet data storage requirements? Should it be on premise? Is cloud uh, data solutions, is that satisfactory for your organization? Personal data storage and enc encryption requirements. How much personal information is too much? you know, for your organization to accommodate in the cloud? Do we need any personal information or is just basic details like a first and last name all that's required to deliver the online orientation? Um, and then other components like two-factor authentication to ensure that the right people are logging in and accessing those accounts or potentially single sign-on and API capabilities to existing applications that already authenticate users, uh, you know, their, uh, their personal information. So we can employ or organizations should be able to employ that same username and password to grant access to the orientations that you're delivering. And then obviously reporting and administrative access. What controls are in place to ensure that the right people have access to the aggregate data that's being completed? It shouldn't just be open for anybody to grab. When we're discussing things like API and SSO capabilities, we're talking about external integrations. So does this onboarding solution need to communicate with your payroll application or another scheduling application or other external software? Ensuring the software that you're opting into to deliver this has those capabilities um, or has the future capabilities as you grow into this space is imperative. Um, to ensure that administratively, you know, you're not having to create user profiles manually on the uh, on the learning management side. It can be auto facilitated by your payroll system. And then finally, internal integrations. When reviewing onboarding orientation software, look for systems that integrate features so they work together within the same software. An example of this would be delivering an online orientation that's complete with videos and testing is great. But what if we could also do the employee's contracts? and their privacy review and their tax documentation all within the same application and have that digitally collected and submitted, that simplifies the process and again, pre prevents the, uh, the need to administrate you know, multiple applications outside of that single solution. Continuing on with this, obviously cost, right? Price. Be sure to keep in mind that there are two costs to consider when they're deploying an online solution. The first one, is the initial development cost to get that online version of your training material. Do you need a third party to create this for you or do you have the knowledge and resources in-house? Do you have the software that's required? Do you have the voiceover talent? Um, and then obviously, do you, you have the capabilities to update and revise the orientations as time progresses? So all of that needs to come into play. Oftentimes, it makes significantly more sense to contract to a third party to develop it um, and then obviously keep in mind, you know, who owns that IP. Uh, you want to ensure that you have access to that material and you own that material so revisions in the future don't cost you an arm and a leg. The second part of the costing is deployment costs of the LMS or learning management system to deliver and track the completion of the content. So you've built the course, now you need the solution to host and deliver it, and there are going to be ongoing hosting costs or delivery fees associated to this uh, distribution. You want to ensure that the cost of that solution is less than what your traditional mechanism is with or instructions, you know, or instructors, facilities, all that kind of stuff that adds up. Make sure that the solution that you're opting in for provides you with a significant cost savings, even in the long term for distribution. Um, Finally, testing and, and ensure processes work as expected. You're going to have to put in place, you know, a trial, get a user acceptance testing group in place, determine the scope of what that testing and size of the group, the length of the time. And there's going to be an obviously cost associated to that, um, you know, potentially even before you sign off on this as a, as a launch. So there will be costs associated to just a just a test rollout before you decide to pull the pin and go live with this, keep that, that, that sort of you know, initial testing in mind. And then if using a third party, research the vendor and their reputation. How long have they been doing this? How many clients do they successfully support? Do they provide support after the solution is rolled out? Or once the implementation done, do they just wash their hands of it and walk away? So all of those are factors that you need, need to consider as part of the rollout. Finally, virtual proctoring. This is oftentimes an integration to existing learning management systems. It doesn't exist as part of the native learning management uh, platform. It's an add-on that comes at an additional cost. So we want to discuss with you today, 
you know, some of the benefits of this. So obviously participation verification is, is, is critical. We need to know that it's the right person sitting in front of the computer and that they are in fact sitting through the orientation, absorbing it, uh, that information as it's provided and that the testing, you know, offers that level of integrity. We also want to be able to utilize virtual proctoring to, to identify gaps in the orientation. So as I was saying earlier, can we improve it? Is there, you know, are they engaged through the, through the session? Are they falling asleep? Are they not paying attention? Are there areas of the orientation that can be improved? Are your staff attempting to bypass the orientation requirements by potentially starting the session and then walking away? Are they leaving? Are they having other people attempt to do the orientation? Those are all indicators of potential behavioral issues that might need to be dealt with before the hiring decision is finalized or dealt with early on in the relationship to ensure that they, you know, that that integrity issue doesn't become an ongoing problem. So virtual proctoring is something to consider as, uh, you know, for your organization. I would say any sort of messaging or health and safety critical uh, training should have virtual proctoring attached. The end result of it is should there be an incident, you will have the backup and the data that supports the fact that you as the employer did everything within your power to ensure that the message was delivered effectively. So thank you everyone for listening to me ramble on for the past 30 minutes. I would like to pass the presentation over to my colleague, Andrew at this time, and he's gonna be discussing the actual development of uh, engaging content and what that process looks like. Andrew, over to you, sir. Awesome, thanks a lot, Scott. I wanna start just by thanking everybody uh, for being here and also for having me here. Uh, it's super exciting to look at online learning as a way to help your new hires succeed. And something that we can look at is moving your training from in-person presentations to virtual environments. Now, at first, this can seem overwhelming. There's lots of different ways to build a course and a multitude of programs that are available. Some can be picked up quickly, others require years to master. But at the end of the day, the onboarding content can be transformed and streamlined to make everybody's first few days exceptional. And the big takeaway is here is you can build training to help new hires get up to speed faster, on the job faster, and save your company time and resources. So when making online content, it may seem like a simple process, but keep in mind that every line of text, animation, video, everything you see on screen is what your employee sees. It has to be tracked, organized, and timed. So on the surface, it looks like simple videos, but as we peel back these layers, we start to see that making these videos is a much more complicated process. Just as a reference point, it's a single hour of course material will be composed of hundreds to thousands of variables, all of which need to be controlled. Since this is such a complicated process, content creators need to be looking forward and never staying in one place, as this is your first impression to all those individuals that are on the job. And for, for our company, we use Adobe After Effects and Articuline Storyline 360 for building our courses. They're fairly immersive and they provide an ease for learners, but also an ease for development as well. So over the years, we've developed some best practices for onboarding videos. And while we can make the most technically complete and sound courses, if they're not built the right way, it has very little impact if the individuals taking the course have trouble taking it. So the content that we create needs to be exciting, engaging, and resonate with each user. And this is a challenging feat on its own. But through the years, we've taken time to collect feedback from many users that have taken courses and found that we were able to unlock some tips and suggestions when you go to build your own online courses. So the first one is variety. Uh, we found that most users lose interest quite quickly if they're seeing the same image for a long period of time. So we like to switch this up every 15 to 20 seconds have images, videos, animations, or infographics, just to keep the interest levels higher. <clears throat> Connection is an also one, another one there. If learners and admins are not connected to the content, it'll be challenging to retain the knowledge. So efforts should be made to personalize the user experience. And this is a powerful learning tool on its own. Adding the tasks and hazards and organizational structure for the course will make the content re relevant and feel tailored to each individual. Volume is another one. We're not talking about sound here, we're just talking about the amount of information that is being sent to each user. We wanted the user to get in, get the information they need and get back out and make sure that they return the information. So delivering that information in a way that is efficient is another important tip when planning onboarding videos. And the last one is voiceover. And this one is just simply, and probably one of the easiest ones to initiate when doing onboarding training is just setting the voiceover at the right speed 
if a user is talking or a voiceover is talking way too slow, user feedback will likely tell us that it might be a boring presentation. If the user is talking or the voiceover is talking way too fast, on the other hand, it, it might be hard to understand what they're talking about. But we found that 140 words per minute is the perfect speed. This is what people like to hear with their voiceover. And a lot of voiceover companies will allow you to set this when setting this up. So continuing on, we can look at multimedia and interactive elements. And for onboarding, uh, this is really your best friend. Multiple forms of media is paramount and courses need to maintain engagement and build a connection to each user. And this can be completed during the onboarding process. New hires, or it can be complicated during the onboarding process as new hires may be distracted by outside factors. They might be thinking about people's names they just made, places they need to go to, where are they having lunch, and new things that are, occur on the first few days. Other considerations are how these interactive elements are deployed. If these are too frequent or too challenging, this would overcomplicate the learning experience. So if they're not built properly and put into courses properly, you may be adding more room for error in your online courses. You want the focus on the content to be on the on the, the focus of the course to be on the content, engagement to be high. So one thing you could do here is use a lot of interactive activities. And these are quite the very cost-effective ways to increase engagement simply through interaction with content. For work processes that have a lot of steps or topics that have a lot of, a lot of areas that need to cover, you can insert an activity that provides a user with the opportunity to control their learning experience. So on the screen here, we have an example of one of these simple activities where you can click a button and bring up more information. And these are called click to reveal activities where the user points and clicks on content and it's a very effective way to deliver content. And it moves away from that linear learning where information is presented to the user. In this case, the user gets to choose their own direction and path for the learning experience. You can also introduce scenario-based activities. And these are a very unique way to cover course content. With scenarios, you move away from just showing the learner information and you move towards having them learn by doing. And on the screen here, if you have your phone with you, you can scan this QR code. We are sending this slide deck out to all participants. So this can be scanned at any time, but this will bring up an activity. And by scanning this activity through this QR code, it'll ask you to turn your phone to the side and it'll just run through an interactive scenario. So for this uh, scenario, it, it's all about driving. And there's really two phases. One phase begins with covering following distance. The learner needs to keep their vehicle in the proper distance in, behind another vehicle. And while this would seem like the training, it's actually practice for the next stage. And this is super helpful in building scenarios. You want to practice round for people as they go through the course. You might have less tech savvy individuals and they made a little practice before getting into it. The second part of this scenario is going through texting and driving. And this is a huge hazard on every road in North America. And this really mimics that experience. You have to get through this exercise while also texting and driving. So scenarios like these can be designed around your workplace. Instead of following distances, you might mimic processes that your new employee might be doing on the work site. You can design scenario and workplace procedures to be included into your course and learn by doing. And this really helps to build that personalization of the onboarding experience. You've hired the individual, you know their role, it's, it's defined. So you can use this information to personalize the onboarding experience. You can base these onboarding topics around actual things people will be doing. The entire course layout and structures can be designed around the role and versus just the topics. And this personalizes the overall experience and makes for a longer lasting course individuals will feel connected to it and will be ready to go and ready to work on site much quicker. As once an online course is made, and depending on the type of course you made, there may be a need to update it. Technology is always changing and evolving, but you can plan for this during the course build, and this could delay any required updates. And there's a lot of simple things that you can do. You can start by searching for any visible signs of aging. So when you're looking at a course, you might look at images and which ones are uploaded into the course and bump up the resolution on those images. That's a fairly easy change to make. 
Another easy change to make is looking for images that have dates. So look out for lockout, tagout tags, paperwork, logos, and these are easy to be found and can be edited. A classic example of one that we see quite often is pictures of people in a lunchroom. These are always included in onboarding videos and courses, and there always seems to be a calendar on the wall. And while it is fine the year that the course is made, it instantly dates the course. So you want the learner to think that this course is new and fresh, and not dated. So always look for those images that have dates in them. Also try to diversify your approach as trends in e-learning shift over time. We're seeing that longer classroom type courses are slowly being replaced by bite-sized chunks of information and interactivity. Keep this in mind when building e-learning content and also have an open mind when designing courses. Provide training and opportunities for developers to learn about new software, new AI advancements that are coming out daily and the design styles that stay up to date and relevant. Now we're just gonna look at some of the common challenges with onboarding, especially doing this online. So online presents a challenge on its own. What a lot of people here are likely thinking about is what about technological issues? These do happen. How many of us have been at a Teams, Zoom, or any type of Skype call and had everything freeze? LMSs may be updating and programs may be altered or delayed. The key here is to plan for these to happen. Select companies who provide guarantees and service level agreements to ensure that if an issue does occur, it is only a day and not a total hindrance on your onboarding procedure. A second challenge you may be thinking of is what about technological literacy? Not everyone gets computers, and this is fine as well, as long as you plan your course around that and your onboarding around that. Keep to simple procedures and button selection with clear directions. That is a big key for every user. If you have clear directions on a scenario or an activity in a course, it just helps further down the line. Also select a provider that has live technical support that can help users and learners at all times with their issues. And continuing on with online challenges, we come back to personal connections and this can be challenging again, but it can be prevented by adding video from leadership or other individuals in the worksite in the training. This is a very common technique that is done in onboarding courses that we've cre created. Montages of people working in their roles or of the building they were working in are an easy way to obtain with today's phones and some proper lighting, in, including in courses. This also solves some challenges in engagement and attention. Using the tips we've provided will help so far greatly with this. Plan in advance, research your audience, understand the role and the most important takeaways that a course needs to really knock it out of the park and choose a provider that can deliver on all of these levels. Now, I'm just gonna pass it over to Scott here to talk more about how you can measure success and gauge your return on investment with switching to online. Thanks, Andrew. So everyone, I'll go really quick in the last couple of slides. I wanna make sure there's adequate time to respond to your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but obviously measuring successful uh, you know, results from, an, from transitioning to an online orientation or onboarding approach is critical. So some of the components to consider when measuring those success rates um, is completion rates. Most online onboarding systems make it easy to review those completion uh, results. So are the people that you're presenting this to actually doing the training? Um, are they, you know, are they leaving it in the middle of it and never actually generating a completion certificate? Are they failing or passing the testing that's associated to it? Making sure that you're on top of those uh, of, you know, achieving a great completion rate that is better than what you have, you know, experienced traditionally is critical. Onboarding timeframe, helping identify if you have a positive ROI, uh, transition to that, you know, how long is it taking you to transition into this online process? But then beyond that, how quickly are orientations and onboarding uh, processes being completed? Is it, it should be better than traditional methods. Assessment outcomes, um, how are they doing with those assessments? How are the teams completing those tests? How many need to attempt the assessments more than once? And is the testing actually accommodating or accomplishing what you expect it to? Uh, to do. Perhaps you need to reevaluate the test questions or the testing levels that you're actually working with. Um, and as an adjunct to that, feedback surveys. We can utilize systems to provide feedback opportunities for your, your teams as they're progressing through their orientation and onboarding. Um, they can provide real-time feedback on what they thought about the training, areas that need to be improved, and then obviously monitoring that feedback to ensure that you're actioning those changes will just have, uh, have you improving in ever 
increasing the quality of your online orientation. Um, utilizing the built-in software reporting, uh, the tools that come with your learning management systems and delivery mechanisms to stay on top of all the analytics is critical. And then most importantly, having a leadership-driven you know, approach and improvement to this process. You need buy-in from your organizational leaders um, to ensure that the uh, migration to an online uh, system is done successfully and that they are committed to making sure that this process you know, works in the future as well. Um, it is a big transition. It comes with initial, initial costs and making sure that the entire leadership team is committed will make this much smoother in the uh, long run. Um, thank you everyone for your time today. I'd like to pass it back to uh, my friend, Michael, who's gonna summarize the presentation and then we'll open up for questions. Awesome, thanks Scott. I'm gonna keep this uh, very brief as well, just so we can get to some questions here. Um, but throughout the presentation, we're hoping that you take some value out of this. Hopefully uh, it wasn't just the three of us uh, kind of droning on for an hour, um, but you should have taken away kind of the main benefits of transitioning online, as well as some tips on how to choose the best uh, software tools for your company, whether it's, whether it's BIS safety software or a different provider. There are a ton of great providers out there. So hopefully you've taken away some um, tools to make the right choice for your company. Um, as well, you should have some tips from Andrew on how to create engaging training material. He had a lot of great stuff in there just to keep the team engaged while they're going through onboarding and orientations, as well as the common challenges and how you can overcome them um, while you're doing the transition from in-person to online orientations and onboarding. And finally, um, that was a really quick final uh, section of the presentation, but hopefully you'll have an idea of how to kind of start to understand is this returning on the investment that we're putting in for transitioning online? So hopefully you've taken away those elements to it. And now we'll open it up. I'll send it. Oh, actually, sorry. Before I do that, we do have some additional resources. And like Andrew mentioned, um, this slide deck will be going out to everybody who's here. Um, so we will have links as well as the QR codes there. So we have a savings estimate calculator there. So you can kind of see a rough estimate of how much you could potentially save if you do switch to online orientations or onboarding. We also have an onboarding white paper that takes you through a lot of the same material that was in this webinar, but in greater depth and detail. Um, and then we also have some API documentation just from our side as well. So you can review any of that documentation um, as, as you will there. But now I'll pass it back to Barry, um, who's going to take us through the question and answer section for the next eight minutes or so. Great. Thank you, Michael. And thanks to Scott and Andrew for sharing your knowledge with us today. Before we start the q and I want to let everyone know about the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after this webinar. And your input is really important to us because it does help us to improve our future webcasts. So let's go ahead and get to some of those questions. Uh, first question we have is, uh, how long does it typically take to implement an online onboarding system within most companies? Um, yeah, I'll field that to start. Um, Andrew, you can jump in if, you know, if I'm off the mark here. But there's two different components to consider when doing the implementation. One is the development time for the actual material itself. Um, in my experience, most professional contractors uh, to develop a high-quality voiceover orientation you're probably looking at between three and six months, depending upon the length um, and amount of content that needs to be uh, included in that. Uh, you know, when we're talking about, you know, length and amount of content, there might be on-site filming required. There might be, you know, animations and graphics that need to be generated. There's obviously voiceover recording. And then there's going to be a lot of back and forth with, uh, you know, between the contractor and the client to determine, does it meet their needs? Are they satisfied with the final product? So I would leave three to six months for development of the actual material. The, out, the, the ability to test and roll out. I would probably dedicate a minimum of 30 to 45 days. So you're going to have a testing group. You're going to have potentially a matrix, matrix of requirements. You're going to have user accounts that are going to be, you know, assigned the content, testing the content, review the reporting, and determining if there's any outstanding gaps prior to a successful rollout. Now, and all of that operates under the caveat that we could, you know, like reality is that could be sped up. Um, you know, we can meet real, like our team here could meet, you know, quicker turnaround times if necessary, but that's typically what I find on average. Great. Thank you for that, Scott. Um, I wanted to ask, we, we had a question come in about online proctoring, Scott, and, and are there any legal requirements or legal concerns about online proctoring? 
Yeah, so I responded on for, probably pr very poorly in the in the chat about it. Um, it depends on the jurisdiction that you operate in. I mean, I can speak you know, at length about uh, the you know about our uh, legal requirements in Alberta. It actually stipulates in the Health and Safety Code that any online training that's delivered is required to be proctored. Now, the reality is, is that if you're delivering training on, you know, like uh, GHS or WIMIS 2015, which you know what we call it in Canada, um, it's highly unlikely that there's this potential safety critical message that's associated to it or something that's, you know, going to, gonna you know, potentially cost a life. However, if they're dealing with chemicals, you know, significantly abrasive chemicals or whatnot, um, that might convince a employer to employ proctoring because if an incident does occur, the courts will put the burden on the employer to show proof that that, em that employee did in fact take training if it was online. Virtual proctoring can have a couple different versions of it. There might be just validation of ID, which means that at the start of an of a online course or an online orientation, the system will capture who it was that logged in. And then there's no monitoring beyond that. But then secondarily, true proctoring will actually monitor the employee as they progress through the training to ensure that they didn't fast forward, they didn't, you know, leave field of view of the camera, somebody else didn't complete the training for, you know, for you. So, um, you know, the argument is in, in play that that you should always have it attached. But uh, in my experience, it's, it's based upon the criticality of the message that's been delivered and the risk involved in the training. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the next question we have is, um, you know, we've all had technology fail when we need it. And you spoke about remote locations of some workforces. So what advice would you have uh, if a system does go down when you need to onboard a group of people? Um, most service providers have a fairly significant amount of redundancy in place. Like earlier, one of the, you know, the compliance and uh, your regulatory requirements, when, you know, let's say a SOC 2 audit is completed on a solution provider, Part of that audit is measuring redundancy and backup capability. So it's, it's so usually if you have a fairly established vendor providing you those services, the service level agreements provide close to a 99% uptime. Like it's a minimal, there's, there's a very, very small window of opportunity to be without capabilities to access it. Usually the, the challenge falls on the side of your, you know, internal intranet. Like if your local Wi-Fi, you know, drops out in your business or local internet is out in the area, there's not much that can be done to satisfy because most of these services are not on premise. Gotcha. We did have a follow up uh, come in, Scott, to the proctoring question. And sure. um, our attendee asks, is a quiz or a test evaluation considered proctoring? Not necessarily, right? Okay. Um, a quiz or a test. I mean, if I, let's say I'm, I'm you know, a new employee for one of your organizations and you assign me an online orientation, I could have my teenage son sit down in front of the computer to complete that orientation and likely would be able to answer the testing questions that are associated to the material delivered in the orientation just as effectively as I would have. At the end of the day, the certificate is issued, the reporting says that I completed it, but I actually didn't spend any time in front of that computer. So quizzing and testing evaluates the knowledge of the participant, but proctoring confirms who that participant was. Great. Thank you for that. That's a that's a great point. Uh, appreciate that. Our, our next question is, how long does it take to see a return on investment after you make a switch to an online tool? So uh, uh, the, the biggest part of determining that is, is really comes down to the cost of the development that you put into it. I've seen orientations that, you know, a, a client will create, which is what we refer to as like a level one development, which is virtually a, you know, a really nice PowerPoint with voiceover, you know, content. Those orientations for a 30 minute to 45 minute, uh, you know, bit of information might be $15,000 to develop. If you're employing an instructor, if you have facility costs, if you're onboarding, you know, a hundred employees, let's say within, within a month, you're probably going to realize the ROI on that, on that initial development immediately, because $15,000 is a fairly insignificant amount of money when you're dealing with a hundred onboards. Um, I think the statistics indicate that the average cost to onboard a new employee, um, when you take into account all the training that goes in and their their you know initial input into the system, is about fifteen hundred dollars. Um, you know, statistically across the across multiple industries. So realistically, you'd realize that you know that return on investment from a fifteen thousand dollar upfront cost, probably within about 10, 10 onboards. Um, but an organization that invests $100,000 in their online orientation because they've got drone footage and videography and whatnot incorporated into it, um, usually their ROI is going to take a little bit longer. But those larger scale investments are also for larger scale you know, clientele that are potentially onboarding thousands of employees. So it could be quicker.
Certainly. Um, it looks like we have time for one more question today from our audience. And, and that question uh, involves multi-generational workforces. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we have some workers who are not as tech savvy as others. Um, how does an online tool meet that need for all workers? Yes, that's a great question. We actually experienced that uh, and learned a lot from our initial interactions with Suncorp, that, you know, that case study that I provided initially. Um, a, a truly solid vendor for delivering this will make the user interface simple. So the assignment of the content uh, to a user account should be, you know, front and center in their face, whether they can do it on a cell phone, whether they need a laptop or whatnot. Um, the reality is, is that it should be easily usable on any device that's accessible and it shouldn't require a lot of navigation. In the case of Suncor, it was literally a link that the user was sent. They clicked on it. They provided their first and last name and basic contact information and hit submit. And then the, the, the content was launched for them. So tech savvy really doesn't come into play when you're navigating one page. Anyone that's ever signed up for anything online or created a email address with it, you know, in an online system can usually facilitate a learning management system, you know, access to, to an online training. Um, but that's a factor that you need to look at when you're determining a vendor. Is their system intuitive? Is it easy to use? And what are the options that you have available for, for granting access? Um, do you need to administratively control who can access it or can the user self-facilitate their own access? All of those are questions that need to be answered. And if, if I can just jump in really quick to add as well. Absolutely. Another, another factor that can really help out is the level of support that the vendor provides. So the after support care for those clients. So some vendors will provide a certain number of hours that you're limited to for technical support, whereas others will open it up and say, hey, you're our client call in any time. Your users can call in, we can help them troubleshoot issues if they need to reset passwords, all those kind of things. So it's it's really important to, to check into the level of support that you're going to get, as well as your users are going to get when they're actually using the system. So. Yeah, great point, Mike. Thanks. Excellent. Well, folks, unfortunately, we've run out of time today. We thank you all for attending this presentation, and we would appreciate you taking the time to share your feedback via our survey. A special thank you goes out today to our outstanding presenters, Scott McLeod, Andrew Lintz, and Michael Blanchard, and of course, everyone from our sponsor at BIS Safety Software. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. Take care, everyone, and have a safe day.